Welcome everybody, thank you for joining the uh, lecture on AI planning and games. Um, before we start, uh, I, give, I need to give an apology because my voice is not the best in the moment. Uh, currently got a cold, so if my voice doesn't sound particularly well, that's the reason for it. Uh, secondly, I might not be here for the Q&A session. Uh, reason being that I might have a second daughter, uh, either currently in hospital or at home with a newborn, so I might not be available to answer any questions. However, at the end of the presentation, I do give my uh, Twitter uh, handle, so if you, if you want to get in touch, that's the way to do it, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have at the end of this uh, presentation. So, we're going to talk about AI playing systems, which is a subject close to my heart. Uh, I did a PhD in it, and I worked about seven years in academia afterwards, mainly on autonomous robotic systems. Uh, two examples see the very bottom, so one, a underwater autonomous vehicle, to operate and uh, maintain a subsea uh, facility. And on the right, in collaboration with uh, child psychologists, we worked on an autonomous robot that could interact with children, and he see one tiny in a room. So about five years ago, I joined the gaming industry <coughs> uh, to work on an AI there. So in my free time, I do have a passion for self, uh, self play systems using AI playing systems at, at their core. So on the left you see two examples of projects I've uh, worked on. So the top one is OpenTDD, where here you see a bot I created in operation uh, playing the game by itself. And at the bottom you see uh, bots in a game I've made using my own 3D engine in a uh, Quake uh, Arena sort of uh, gameplay where the bots will try to kill each other and the player. In my professional capacity, I work in the games on the right, um, and I created bots that can play as the player, finishing the entirety of these games you see on the right. So, it's Evil Genius 2, Zombie Army 4, and the upcoming Sniper Elite 5. And we'll see examples as a video of these in action later on in the presentation. So, first, we're going to have a quick chat about traditional techniques, and these are the ones that the majority of game studios will uh, currently use to operate the AI. So, be it for state machines, behavior trees, sometimes even scripts. Uh, we're going to contrast that with the AI planning systems, uh, what benefits they bring, and the uh, problems they might, uh, might have trying to introduce AI planning to your uh, game AI. Uh, first, going to give a introduction to AI playing in general, give a broad overview, and then we're going to dive into specifics of GOPE, goal-oriented action, uh, goal or action planning, and HGN, Oracle Task Networks. And lastly, we're going to talk about some applications where these uh, techniques might be used in, or already have been used in, and I'll give you some examples, and further references if you want to uh, look up any further. So the approach with like your traditional techniques is that they are widely used, they integrated in most game engines, they're easy to implement and they're relatively well understood. You can give like a very small example of these systems and people intuitively understand how these, uh, these work and how they can use them in their own uh, AI settings. The problem being though, they don't scale very well. Uh, very quickly, you'll find that the behavior trees, the first state machines, and even scripts will blow up exponentially with a number of uh, states and uh, edge cases they need to handle. And also, then they are reactive, so they can only ever respond to what the current uh, world state is and do whatever is best in this particular location without considering necessarily how their uh, actions they take now might impact future actions or how they would uh, impact the future state of the, of the world. So there's no planning ahead to see what the best uh, sequence of actions is, just for what we now we should be doing now uh, to, to uh, take the best decision in the AI uh, decision making. So let's have a look at final step machines. So here we've got a very simple example with a start and a goal location. And the aim is to get to start from goal. Relatively simple. So we've got two nodes representing the state of being at the start location and the state of being at the goal location. And we get to positions between the different states using actions. So we can move to goal, which takes from the start location to the node that is now at the goal location. And we go, to, can go back the other way to go back to the start. So that's relatively simple. But if we say at a door, we now need to encode what the state of the door is in our current uh, state nodes. So we need to add 
if the door is open, we can move to the call location. And we need additional nodes to encapsulate the knowledge that the door might be closed. So we have two more nodes. And we connect additional actions to allow us to open and close the door and find a plan, uh, a sequence of actions using the uh, state machine like that. Now, if we say we add keys and we say we need a key to open the door, then again, we need, in addition, encapsulate where the key is in all the states. And again, the number of nodes that we need to uh, capture doubles again. So here you see that the more, um, <coughs> more object, more stage you need to encapsulate, the bigger and bigger these fine state machines get and eventually become unwieldy. So behavior trees do things slightly different. So instead of having all the states in uh, specific nodes, uh, all we do here is we evaluate this, the current state of the system and then figure out what we should be doing in this current situation. So the way uh, behavior trees work is you start at the roots and you just go down, uh, first go to the leftmost child, and evaluate them in order and figure out what we should be doing. So there are three different uh, entities in the behavior trees. We've got our Slexus, which is a special node that can have multiple children. And the idea here is that the selector will try the left mode child first. Uh, if that succeeds, then we're done. If it fails, it tries the next child. and keeps going through all its children until one of them succeeds and then the uh, behavior tree is done and we put stuff from the top, the top again. So in our case, we first check, are we already at the goal location? Because if we're there, there's not, not much else to do. But you can see it actually queries a, the state of the world. So is at goal true? So where this information is, uh, is maintained is not in the, in the state of the behavior tree itself, but it's not external to it in a so-called blackboard. So the blackboard is a system that can hold any number of values and any system in your game can write uh, to this blackboard and change the states of these uh, variables. So we need to add an add goal uh, boolean variable to the blackboard and the execution of the behavior tree, we just check is this value true in the blackboard. If it is true, then we enter a sequence and we just wait. There's nothing else to do, so we might just play the idle animation or whatnot. Now, if we're not at the goal, so this a bit fails, then because of selector we go to the next entry and this asks us do we have the key. So again, it has key values added to the backboard and if that's the case then we can now open the door and then move to the goal and we're done. Lastly, if we don't, we're not at the goal, we don't have the key, then we add our sequence and the sequence being that all children must uh, complete uh, and return true for a sequence to succeed. So whereas the selector will try different children until it finds one that succeeds, the selector only succeeds, or sequence only succeeds if all of their children succeed. So here I've got not a goal, not have the key, move to the start location, pick up the key, and we're done. So let's now look at uh, AI planning and how that works. So we're going to first introduce the concept of a domain independent AI planning system. So the idea here is that you use the same planning system to solve a, a whole array of different uh, problems. So you can use the same planning system to solve, for example, uh, warehouse management, to operate autonomous robotic systems in different environments, uh, controlling urban traffic flow by uh, changing uh, the uh, traffic lights in the system, and indeed, use the same planning system to, to operate the AI uh, agents in the games. So such a system consists of two components. So the first one is the domain, which is an abstract model of the game we are currently looking at, or indeed any domain. So the first thing we need to define is what things, what type of things exist in your world. So do you got things like players, enemies, locations, weapons, pickups, doors, etc. Secondly, you need to find what pred uh, the predicates in your domain. So what uh, properties and relationships do they have? So can a player be at location? Can a player pick up items? Uh, can doors be open and closed? Etc. Uh, and lastly, you need to find what actions can uh, entities perform in your world. So can a player move from one location to another? 
Uh, can play a pick things up. Uh, can it jump onto things? Can it perform like melee attacks, rage attacks, etc.? If it actually specify when they can be performed, so what preconditions might be satisfied. So to move from one location to another location, you might say need to be at the, uh, the first location and must be a feasible path between those two locations. And you to specify, well, how does this affect the world? So moving from one location to another means you're no longer at the first location, but now you're at the other location, for instance. Then during runtime, you need to um, create what's called an AI planning problem. So here you say what instances of types exist. So you say we got a type enemy and we got enemy type 1, 2, 10, 11 and 13, for instance. Then you need to specify what facts are currently true in the world. Uh, so where is the player, where are the enemies, which locations are connected, uh, where are the doors and what location they block, etc. Um, so that will basically form part of the initial state. So here you define what, what's currently true in the worlds that we're looking at. And last part is you define what are the goals. So what must be true for you to say, well, the uh, objective that we're currently trying to do is, uh, is complete. So it could be anything like the player is dead or we reach the uh, end of the level, whatever you like it to be. So let's look at an example of such a system. So we're first going to define a domain. So we've got our types, our predicates, and our actions. And we're going to look at a very simple, silly zombie game that we want to uh, encourage as an abstract model. So first of all, let's look at the type. So we say we've got a type of player and location. These are the type of things that exist in the world. On the predicates, we then, we then say, well, what facts can we construct using these types? So here we say a play can be at location, a play can be dead, and two locations can be connected. Then we also got enemies. So similar to players, an enemy can be at location, an enemy can be dead. And here we can see there's a bit of overlap between the predicates of players and enemies. So they can both be at locations, they can both be dead. So we can simplify that by creating a new type, actor, that's a super type of both enemy and player, and then we can say that an actor is a location and an actor can be that to simplify uh, the domain we're currently constructing. Then we add a new type, item. So we can say item can be at location. So imagine playing on the floor or on a table or something like that. And we also say we now introduce a numeric uh, fluent. So the Boolean ones are since that can be true or false. So an actor can be, can be at location or it can't be at location. Uh, so with numeric fluence, we say that an actor can have a certain number of items. So we don't assign to this a, a false or true value, but a number to indicate how many items of a certain type an actor has it's in the infantry. So again, actor and item can both have locations, so we can simplify again by creating a new supertype locatable, that supertype of item at actor, and we can say a locatable can be at a location. Lastly, we introduce the door. So here we say uh, a door can block two locations. So imagine a door with a location on either side of the door. And we can say the door can be interacted with or opened using a specific item. So these type of predicates don't really mean much without context. And that's given by the actions that will inform us uh, how these um, predicates interplay with each other. So let's have a look at one action called the move action. So an action consists of three separate components. So first of all, we've got the name of the action, in this case move, with a list of parameters. Uh, so the question mark will indicate a particular variable and the hyphen after will take will to specify the type of this thing. So here you've got like uh, P is of type player and from a to of type location. So to move, we then need to specify when can we move. So these are the preconditions. So here we say that the player must be at the from location and the from and to location must be connected. The last bit are the effects. We will tell us if we would execute this action, how does the uh, state of the world change in relation to it? So after we move the player, we are no longer at the from location, but now the player is at the to location. So this little symbol here means we negate this uh, this predicate, so this is no longer true and this will become true. So open will allow the player, P, to open the door D using the item item uh, 
and will connect the uh, location inside the door no matter where from and to. So instead of play must be the from location, the door must require a specific item and will then open the way from the from location to the door location. And we insist that the player must hold at least one item of that type in its inventory to actually open up the door. So the effects become that now the locations on either side of the door now become connected. The door no longer blocks these locations and the number of items in the player's inventory is now decreased by one. So here we say by interacting with the door we actually lose the item that we used. Um, you can imagine that we can specify this differently and say well actually if it's a key then this doesn't get consumed. And this will highlight that there's many different ways to construct a domain for the same a sort of game and it takes uh, practice experience to figure out what the best way is to model these these things. So then we got a pickup action so I can basically player P can pick up item item at location if both the player and the item are at the same location and after that the item is no longer at location but instead we increase the number of items in player's inventory by one. We've got a kill action so I can say player can play the can kill enemy if they are both the same location. So we require that both the player and the enemy are at the location. And the fact is that the enemy is dead after doing so. So again, highlight here that we only use melee attacks here, but if you want to uh, have a ranged attack, you might need a uh, additional predicates that will say, can we see the enemy from a certain location? In that case, we'll say the player must be at location from which we can see the enemy. And then we can form a uh, ranged attack Again, choice you make here, the main will indicate what actions you can take and how the AI system can actually play uh, the game. So do note that we do not actually remove the enemy being at location, we just say the enemy is now dead, because the next action, the loot action, allows the player to loot an enemy, at, uh, enemy and take an item from the enemy infantry and take it, put it into its own inf uh, infantry. So, we demand that the player enemy are at the same location, that the enemy is dead, and that the enemy has at least one uh, of that particular item if it's infantry. The effects being that now the player has one more of that item in its infantry, and the enemy loses one item off of its infantry. So this is the way you can model a, uh, a loot action. So altogether, this now forms the domain of our little zombie games. We've got our types, our predicates, and our actions. So the next step of course is then well how does this work in practice? So say this is the current state of the world and we want to create a playing problem and find a plan that will solve the, uh, the uh, playing problem we're about to create. So first thing to look at are the objects. So what objects exist in the world? So here we've got a zombie of type enemy, a key of type item, a player of type player, C4 also type item, uh, two doors, door one and door two. And then we need to create the locations that are relevant for us. So you might imagine there's quite a bit of pre-processing when it comes to creating a playing problem. For one, we need to figure out, well, what locations do we care about in the world? So this would be where the enemies are, where the player is, where any items are. But at the same time, we need to figure out, well, at what locations can we interact with the door and how do we construct two locations so that one is on one side of the door and the other one is on the opposite of the door. So the locations here, we've got where the zombie is, where the, we can interact with the door on either side, the C4. Here we've got a goal location. So this is a goal where we want to get to. And we got the location where the player is. Then we need to specify what is the initial state, so what facts are currently true. So first of all, we say the player is at the player location, zombie is at the zombie location, C4 is at the C4 location, and we say that the zombie holds one key in its infantry. Then we need to establish which locations are currently connected. So again, you might use a pathfinder to find the pairwise connectivities of these points to figure out, well, how are all these bits connected to each other? I see I missed one here, so let's ignore that for, for the moment. And then we specify how the doors are connected. So if we locate the both location above the door, 
and figure out what item we need to open the door. So this one here requires a key, and this one here requires a bit of C4 to open the door. And lastly, we specify what the goal set looked like. So what facts must be true for us to say we achieved the goal. So in our case, all we care about is a player reached the goal location. We don't care what the rest of the state looks like or what other facts may or may not be true. As long as the player reached the goal location, we are happy and we say we satisfied our goal. So our plan might look something like this. So first of all, the player moves to the C4 location, picks it up, goes to the door, uses the blow it up, then go to the zombie, kills it, takes the key off the zombie, moves to the door, opens it up with the key, and then we finally reach the goal location. So do note that all we need to do is create the domain, then specify initial states, specify the goal states, and the player will create something like this for us to follow, and this will then become the, uh, the plan to execute. So one of the downsides of planning is that it can be rather expensive. So whereas the uh, fire state machines and your behavior tree should just follow the tree or you follow the tree, the transition to, between the nodes, I will just tell you what to do given the current state of the, uh, of the system. So with planning system, we actually decouple all this uh, completely. So there's no, there's no coupling from a state and which action needs to be executed. We just say a state, this range of actions can be executed. And we just try to find a, a path through the state space, state space that takes us to initial state, to a state where the goal is true at the moment. Now, this state base can be huge. It's to the power number of facts. So it's exponential number of facts and can be huge to explore. So we need some guidance once we start planning to figure out, well, if we got a state, a number of states that we're currently uh, looking at, like which one should I consider first to explore further? Um, and you ask yourself, well, how close every state to a potential state where the goal is true? So we need to find a heuristic of sorts. Now, in AI planning, the most common and probably well-known heuristic is the relaxed plane graph heuristic. And because we use numbers in our system, we actually uh, call it a numeric relaxed plane graph heuristic. But in general, all the heuristics in planning systems are a simplified version of the traditional planning problem. You solve that, and that will basically form the uh, heuristic uh, for the actual state you're looking at. So in terms of the relaxed planning problem, what we do is we remove all the delete actions from our facts. So looking at, for example, the move action, Whereas before the effect would be that player is no longer at the from location, but now at the to location. We remove the lead effects and now we say after moving the player is now at both at the from location and the to location. And we do this for all actions. So in essence what we do is we create this so-called fact layer and we accumulate all the possible facts that could become true at some point. Um, and find, uh, and find a uh, planning a plan using this very relaxed um, abstraction of this initial planning problem. So what we do is we take the initial fact layer, which is the initial state. So all the facts are true, initial state are set here. And for all the numeric facts, we just uh, give it the value it currently has in the initial state. So then we create an action layer and we apply all actions who have their preconditions satisfied in the previous layer. Then we add all positive effects to the next faction layer, the next fact layer. So we just get to see like all the new facts that can become true by applying these actions. Uh, for numeric effect, what we do is we hold a lower and upper bound. So if an action decreases the facts, so for example, effect zero goes from two to zero, we just say the minimum value can be zero and the max value can be two. And as we create more and more fact layers, we get like a broader and broader upper and lower bounds on these values. So what we do as well is we copy all the facts from the previous layer onto the uh, the, the new fact layer. Uh, we sort of call no op actions, but we remove those from um, from this representation to make it a bit more clear what's going on because we'll very quickly clot entire uh, graph. So you keep going until eventually you reach a fact layer where, whatever, where the goals are all uh, satisfied. 
And then you find a plan in this relaxed planning graph that satisfied the, the goal facts. Sadly, finding the optimal plan in this instance is an MP hard problem, so we can't uh, find uh, the best plan in a reasonable amount of time. So instead what we do is we use another heuristic to figure out what actions we should consider to achieve the uh, goal facts. So we start at the back, so like a backward search, so it's okay, which action can achieve the goal fact? In this case, we've got action three and action four. So now we need to figure out which one to use. And we do that by using a heuristic that takes the preconditions of all these actions and sums the fact layer where they first become true. So for action number three, it's got three uh, preconditions that both all three appear fact layer one. So heuristic of applying this action is three. Whereas action four, if there's got more uh, preconditions, two of them appear in initial states and two appear in the first fact layer, so it's got a risk of two. So this is the action we choose to achieve the goal state. And we move backwards and then we try to find for its preconditions their best actions and we keep on going backwards until eventually we find all the actions that achieve all preconditions and we find ourselves our relaxed plan. So in this case, action one, two and four will take us to the goal fact. So three will then be the heuristic of the original uh, state that we could have looked at. It's not the optimal solution though, because the optimal solution would be to take action number three, because even though it's got three preconditions, it can all be achieved by a single action in the first action layer. So the optimal uh, lex plan is of size two. So given all this, let's have a look at goal oriented action planning. So this is based on the strips representation, which is a uh, simpler form of the plane problem that we showed before. So it's got no types, it's got no numeric variables, etc. But otherwise it's more or less the same. So we've got a number of facts that can or cannot be true. We've got our actions, a still name, um, number of uh, objects, and our preconditions and effects, pretty much like we've seen before. And we need our initial state and goal states and we look for a plan that takes from the initial state to the goal state. So it's a very similar representation, uh, just simply less um, expressive. So unlike the uh, the playing system uh, I've shown you before, uh, GOP actually does backward search. So it doesn't start initial state and say, well, which action can I apply to initial state? Create a new state and then figure out what's the best state with the best heuristic, what states can I achieve from there by applying a number of actions to those. Also, we got to the goal state. Here we started the goal state. We ask ourselves which action can uh, achieve the goal state. And then use the preconditions of those actions as, um, as a new state needs to be resolved. And once you resolve all the preconditions by merging them with initial states, then we find our plan. So again, we need to use some kind of heuristic to figure out how close are we to the initial state. And what GOP uses is the number of unsolved preconditions. So as before, our heuristic will actually figure out how many actions do we need to execute to achieve all these preconditions. Here we assume that a single action will, uh, will resolve each individual uh, precondition. So it's less informative as heuristic, but it works all the same. So this system is used in many uh, games. Uh, probably well known is the Fear series, where the system was first pioneered and implemented in an actual uh, game. But also more recently, this has been adapted by various different studios. Uh, so those X S use it as well as Assassin's Creed uh, Wahala. So in the way it works, it's slightly different. So first of all, what it does do is actually add action costs to all the individual actions. So in the previous system that we've seen, we assume that every action has the same cost, a cost of one. Whereas here you can say, well actually, what we want to do is change both the uh, preconditions and effects procedurally while we are executing and while we actually are planning for the system. And this is where the action costs will come in. For instance, you might want to say, well, we've got a character here that can both perform melee attacks and can perform range attacks. So if we just say, well, 
Bugatti 2's action, both actions will result in the uh, player's death, then there's no much incentive to use one over the other. They're both equally valid in the old approach. Or you can say, well, actually, whilst we are planning, what we do is we give a fixed cost to of like say 15 to all the range attacks. That's what it cost us 15 to, to get there. And for melee attack, we calculate what the distance is between ourselves and the player and use the distance in meters as the action cost to perform a melee attack. So here we say if we like within 15 meters, then the, the player would prefer to use a melee attack because it's cheaper than a range attack. If we're further away than 50 meters, we prefer to do range attacks because the melee attack is more expensive. Uh, more uh, expensive. Um, and the execution of this system uh, uses this fine state machine on the left because the author's reason that, well, actually any action you do is in essence a, an animation you perform. And it uses three different types of animation that you can uh, choose from. So you got your go-to animation, which will actually have the player move to different locations. You got your animation, so an action can just be doing animation. So it can be like your reload animation, or to like shoot animation, or you know, probably head off from cover animation. And lastly, but we got a use smart object animation, also use smart object uh, node. So here we've got a an action that has an interaction with a third uh, second object. So it could be things like picking up an item on the floor or interacting with a door or anything like that. So let's look how the goal-oriented action planning system would solve the, uh, the problem we've looked at before. So first of all, we need to figure out well, what facts could be true in the state. So we've got uh, at start facts, at goal facts, has key, the key being at the start or call location, and the door can be open or closed. So then we need to specify which of these facts are true in the initial state, and which facts do you want to be true to have achieved the, the goal state. So a good thing to note here that we use a closed world assumption, meaning that, that all facts are not um, explicitly said to be true, are soon to be false. So the initial state we are at the start location and the key is at the start location as well and the goal set is to be at the goal. And then we've got a whole set of actions so we can move to the goal location, move to the start location, pick up a key at the start location, open a door and many many others. So you can see that the principle is the same as so your preconditions, your facts and the only things we really need are the costs of all these actions. So a plan could look something like this. So we start planning at a goal, so figure out well, which action can achieve to be at the goal location. So that's the move to goal, which got the at start precondition and the door open precondition. So at start is already achieved initial state. The door open can be achieved by the open door uh, at the start location action. The request to be at start and also requires us to have a key. So at start already achieved. And as key requires us another action that says pick up the key at a start location. The request to be at the start location and the key to be at the start location, and those are both true in each other's state. So we find this as the uh, sequence of actions that form the plan of the uh, goal oriented action planning system. So the benefit of this uh, system of planning in general is we don't end up with these massive, massive graphs, if we don't entangle the logic of what we should be doing given any given state. Um, and such as like, well, these are all the facts that can be true, these are all the actions that we can be executed, and these are the big additions of these actions, these are the effects of the actions. So it just becomes like a bag of, uh, of facts and actions, and the rest is all uh, up to the planning system itself to figure out, well, what actions should we apply to arrive to the goal. Um, <coughs> so like we uh, discussed a little bit about the initial states. So how do you construct the goal states? So what, how do you determine what goals need to be true? So in terms of GOPE, only a single goal is ever considered. And in fact, what they do is they create a list of goals and assign priorities to them, saying, well, goal three is like the higher priority goal, so try to achieve that one first. If that fails, and you can't find a plan, try to try the next goal and keep going down the list until you find a goal where you can find a plan for and then execute this plan. 
So an example you can think of is a, a soldier that his ultimate aim is to kill the player. But if the soldier doesn't know where the player is, then it, it gives like a higher um, priority to patrol the area and hopefully stumbling upon the, uh, the player. But if the soldier has heard something, it might be a higher goal to investigate around the uh, sound it heard. Uh, or if it sees a player, then killing the player might be the high, highest, priority, highest priority goal it should go after. So I best in mind saying that not, it's not always possible to find a plan for any goal you achieve, you want to go after. So for example, say the guard sees a player behind the door, and the highest priority goal is now to actually kill the player. But it's got no means to actually open the door, say it's locked and doesn't have the key or the strength to break open the door. Uh, then it needs to consider, like, well, I can't find a plan for my top priority goal, so you need to consider the one lower down. So it might be go back to patrolling or informing other entities that might be able to uh, get to the player, etc. Um, another nice feature of GOP is the idea, like, well, what action do you give uh, to, each, uh, to each entity? Because you might imagine that even though I've got a whole set of actions, it might always be beneficial to give all actions to all entities always because the, it might be on um, the size might not want say a um, a civilian to start attacking the player, where she in essence they want them to run away for instance. Um, and lastly, this idea of uh, where we store the knowledge of each individual entity, because with Gope, in general, we only plan for one AI entity uh, at a time. And those entities got no idea at all about any other entities in the world, except for, say, the player it wants to uh, defeat or kill. So you need to find a way that not all entities fi find the same plan to get to the player and form a conga line or all huddled behind the same bit of cover points. So we need like additional systems uh, to make sure that they do appear intelligent, even though we've got no information about each other whereabouts and actions uh, to begin with. Um, and because we'll do backward search using optimal planning, find the plan with the lowest total action costs. Um, the plans you find in GOB are usually very, very small because they're expensive systems. So at most you find um plans of maybe two to three um actions long not very long at all which makes sense uh because all because if you gotta find a very long plan for an entity of say 50 actions uh it's very quickly uh it's very easy to basically destruct uh, the world or do something the player does something to the world uh, where the plan is no longer valid. So say the entity wants to get behind cover and shoot the player and load a bunch of other stuff. If the player blows off the cover or moves away such that it's no longer live sight from the cover to the player, then the plan fails and need to replan again. So if you've got very long uh, plans, they become very brittle because a lot of things can go wrong uh, by uh, interactions to the uh, world state by other entities. So, one of the benefits of GOP is you can assign different set of actions to, uh, to create different uh, character archetypes. So, for example, say you want to make a soldier, just give it like the attack, move, attack, cover, and reload actions. But if you don't want to make a civilian, use the same planning technology, you just give it a different set of actions it can consider. So, so it can only move, to cover, and cower, and will never be able to attack the player or or anything like that because it doesn't have the actions to do so. And so you can create elite soldiers by just adding additional uh, actions like throwing grenades and rolling to dodge. Uh, so it's very easy to create these character archetypes with just, just chucking different actions into the brackets they can, uh, they can use, which is quite a nice feature of the system. So when it comes to how do we then make sure that all the um, entities in the system work nicely together and don't appear to be very stupid to the player by doing the same thing or from the conga line, it's usually by using an external system that is queried during the playing procedure. So like I said before, um, when we create, when, we, when the planning system is active, uh, it can still uh, figure out well 
So for example, here we say we want to take cover, and we don't specify which bit of cover we want to get into. So we want to take cover of where we can see the player, for instance. But the specifics of where this cover point is are left abstract, we, we don't, don't know. So what we can do is create a cover system that will hold a number of points uh, and maintain which entity is currently occupying or using these uh, cover positions. And also update which one's got life sight to the player, uh, so we can basically dish out or create these points and use them uh, and allow the AI in the entities in the world to use them. So here we got three enemies with the three different plans, all of them take cover, shoot the player and one of them will advance. So we take cover, we ask the cover system, give me a cover point where you can see the player from and a cover point will then return a point and that's then used by enemy one in this instance. So similarly, enemy 2 will not use the same one, because the cover system knows C1 is occupied, so it just gives C3 an instance to number 2. So if it then shoots and 1 advances, C1 becomes free, and it can be used by uh, enemy number 3 to be used, etc. So this gives the illusion that they are working together, even though they got no knowledge of each other whatsoever. And it's just the use of a different external system that gives the appearance that they are smart and use different cover points, uh, and things like that. So that is GOPE in a nutshell, so let's, let's now look at hardcore task networks that are used in Transformers for Cybertron um, and most, no, most well known probably is the Horizon Zero Dawn system. So HDNs use abstra abstra uh, abstraction to simplify the problems. It also allows uh, designers for more control of how specific goals are being achieved. So with the problem with like planning systems is because you allow the planning system to figure out what the best way is to achieve the goals, it doesn't give uh, designers a lot of lean way into say, okay, well, we want to, this goal to be achieved exactly like this because there's no way to do that. The best they can do in GOPE is to assign the action costs and you know make the planner prefer certain actions over others in certain circumstances, but ultimately up to the planning system to figure out what the best way is to achieve these uh, these goals. So with HDNs, you actually give designers a lot more lean way to figure out how goals should be achieved. So let's have a look first at how abstraction works. So when you do abstractions, you take your initial problem, you make it simpler by abstracting, abstracting it, potentially with several layers, then you find a solution to your abstracted, more simplified problem, and then you refine this solution back until you got a solution to the original problem. That's the idea behind abstraction. And the idea is that solving it directly would be more costly than doing it this way around. However, there are a few challenges and properties that need to be kept in mind to see how uh, feasible this is. So first of all, we need to look at the upward solution property. So if a solution exists in the original problem, then it's probably holds if, we, if there's always a solution in the abstract version as well. So we can't have a situation where there's no, where there's a solution for the original problem, but no solution for the abstract problem. Secondly, we got the order automaticity property. So once we find a solution to an abstract problem, we must then make sure that once we refine into the less, basically more concrete representation, that the action that we've chosen in a more abstract version of it still remain relevant and part of the refined plan. Uh, and if we fail to find a, a refinement where these actions uh, still remain relevant, we may need to go back, find a different abstract, a different solution to our abstraction, go back down and keep going back and forth until we find a good abstraction uh, problem to the abstract problem. They can then be refined into a solution of the original problem, and this is a slow process. However, if the down refinement property holds, because that means that any solution we find in the abstraction can be refined into, to, into the solution of the original problem. So it doesn't matter which solution we find, they can always be refined into a solution of the original problem. Now let's have a look at the uh, one potential abstraction that we've seen and used to calculate the uh, numeric Max-Plane graph heuristic, where we remove all the leads from the effects. So now we've got a abstraction, a simplified problem, that is the relaxed planning graph. We solve it, but before it gave us our heuristic. And now we can say, right, so we reinsert all the lead effects and then use the solution 
in of the uh, Lex Plane Graph to find a solution to the original problem. So does this have the upward solution property? It does indeed, because it is a simplified uh, by removing properties, so there's always a plan in the abstraction if there's a solution in the uh, original problem. Sadly, it doesn't have the uh, automaticity property and definitely doesn't have the down refined property. And this is the case for most abstractions that you'll find. Uh, very few plain problems have the down refinement property, so it's never easy to find, uh, to refine an abstract solution back into a solution to the original problem. What we can do, however, is construct these abstractions ourselves so we know that these properties hold and put like the main specific knowledge into these abstractions and then create a problem that can, a planner can solve these type of uh, abstract problems. And this is in essence what the HDNs do. So in HDNs, what you have, you start with a very abstract solution to your problem in form of a task. So we got task achieve goal that takes us from the initial state to the goal state. Now a task can then be decomposed into several subtasks with like uh, different constraints, so task 1 must be become to task 2, and then we keep uh, refining this by unpacking task 1, we can say for actions and refine task 2, and we keep going down, refining all these different tasks, until we find ourselves in a network where all the uh, constraints are satisfied, and we find ourselves with a solution to the problem by uh, applying these actions in this particular order. So what does what a task look like? So a task consists of several subtasks that, can, that the task can be decomposed into. And every subtask can have primitive actions that we've seen before, or it can contain other tasks that need to be decomposed afterwards. And there's got a whole bunch of constraints between these actions and these tasks. So it can be an ordering constraint saying action one must always happen before task one, or action two must be the last thing after all the other bits. Uh, a couple of sections on the bindings, how do the bindings of the different variables of these actions and tasks correlate to each other. Uh, I can set up preconditions, effects, etc. So the number of constraints you, see, you uh, look into is the main dependence, so it can be anything you uh, you want. And the, the playing system will be custom made to uh, solve a specific task with specific constraints that you uh, add, added to the system. So you got it within a task, many task networks, um, and you can use any one of these uh, to refine this, this particular task. So there's multiple ways to refine this task into the more concrete representation by picking one of these. So the idea then is to use uh, high-level tasks to find your abstraction and then decompose the task to go from the abstract solution back to a solution to the original problem. So let's look at an example of such a system. So here we've got the move through door, which takes uh, from two locations and the door as well. And it's got one subtask, or sub one uh, task network, that's got one additional task in it to open the door and then to move uh, through the door to the other location. So we've got a number of preconditions and effects that we've seen before. And most notably also have a number of bindings because the variables in the parameter of the task itself need to be bound to the variables of the subtasks. So here they expect uh, they are expect. So the uh, the from in this subtask here is bound to the from here for the same for the door and same for the two. And we've got order constraints saying that we we'll first must open the door before we attempt to move through it, which makes sense. Now the second task network simply moves from to two uh, with the precondition that the door is already opened. So if the door is already open, we use this subtask to achieve uh, the overall task. If it's closed, we then uh, decompose the task in this one to first open the door. So back to the example we had before. So we've got the uh, abstracted uh, solution to our, to our goal to move through the door from start to the goal location and you move through this door. Easy enough. So you decompose it because the door is closed. So we need to decompose into the first uh, task network that's got other tasks to open the door and then move from the uh, start location to the goal location and we need to decompose this one as well. 
the result in a pickup key, opening the door, and then our solution is like that. So this is in essence what Hardcore Task Networks are. It's a, a very authored uh, abstraction that allows to decompose our task and find, um, find a solution to the overall problem. And because the decompos uh, decomposition is all authored, it allows designers a lot more um, lean way into how specific, um, specific tasks are, are performed. So now that we've spoken about how we construct these uh, plank systems and how we come about uh, finding uh, solutions to them in the form of plans, we're now going to look at the, the execution part of it. So once we've got a plan, how we then go about executing this um, this plan. And we do that by, by introducing a potential framework that we use. Um, so first of all, a plank system requires a domain. So per game, you specify the game rules, so what things exist, what pops can hold true, and what happens if we do something. So our types, our predicates, and our actions. That leads to a problem with the initial state and the goals we need to achieve, and all of this is handled by the execution monitor, which is essentially the beating heart of this entire system. So while we are running the game, the execution monitor will then check the game state and scrape any information, do any normal pre-processing required, to create a initial state and the goal state, or then ask the playing system to create a plan. And if the plan is found, that plan is then being dispatched to the AI entity one action at a time. So the execution monitor will have a plan, or take the first action in the plan and dispatch that to the AI entity to execute. The entity will then uh, use a controller execute it and control will then invoke a system to perform the action and this can be anything for like neural network behavior trees by safe machines whatever you want and here you can see that it's actually a combination of the traditional techniques and the air playing system because the actions that you execute are so limited in scope that it is actually feasible to use behavior trees and find safe machines because you don't have to worry about the context or in other um edge case because all the complexity of these bits are handled by the playing system so things like move or shoot at a player or pick things up are all very simple confined uh, actions to execute and a behavior tree if i say machine contains like a few nodes at most um, to encode uh, the behavior need to be executed so after it's done we will feedback if it succeeded or failed to execute the action and that's then sent back to the execution monitor and we will keep dispatching one action at a time until either a failure is detected, so we fail to do things, or fail to move location, or fail to pick a pick up an item, or if we dispatch the entire action. In that case, we reevaluate the current world state, create a new playing problem, ask for a new plan, and keep going until either the entity is dead, or if we get in some kind of game over state. Uh, so this system can and has been used in many different systems. Uh, let's go look at a few of these here. Uh, so myself, I may be uh, looking into automated testing using self-play by using AI playing systems to self-play games. Uh, but other people have looked into different uh, bits, if you've never the design to how do you go about um, modeling an NPC in open world. So for instance, in Red Dead Redemption, you've got uh, entities who are based on the schedule. So they wake up, they attend the farm, they go to the shop to buy something, go to the saloon to have a beer, and then go to bed, for instance. Uh, but there's not much agency for the player to disrupt these schedules. So you can't, for instance, lock uh, lock the door and throw the key away, or burn, burn down the saloon, or anything like that. Uh, the NPC always follows the same thing with some uh, randomness in them, maybe. But if you can use AI planning to uh, model uh, and then use play to figure out what NPC should be doing to achieve his goal to tend a farm or get a drink or anything like that. The play can mess up the world and the NPC will still find a way to achieve its goals in different ways than just the hard-coded scripted approach that that used nowadays. So let's have a look at some of these examples. So here are a few videos of a uh, system I've uh, worked on. So I think to minimize because the play does play for some reason. So this is Zombie Army 4, a game I've worked on, and we actually managed to uh, play through an entire campaign, like things like about 50 levels by now, 
Uh, using an air bot can play as a player would by using an airplane system at its core to tra traverse through a level. So we create the initial state, create the goal state, and leave it up to the planner to uh, execute the actions necessary to get through the um, get through the level. So he knows it needs to interact with a certain uh, object in the game. He switches to open up a different door to gain access to a different part of the level. And none of this needs to be hard coded. We just say this is how the world, how the world looks like. This will actually can take and get yourself to the end of the level. And the playing system will perform what it needs to do to make this all happen. So here we got a blood fountain that requires activation. Kill all enemies within this vicinity. Open this door here. And we can just encode all this information and the playing system will take care of, uh, of the rest of it. So I went through a play through the entire video, but this is like the first save room, now we keep going. So similarly, we've done the same thing for Evil Genius 2, a very different game. Which is mute as the direct league. Uh, where here the playing system needs to build up a lair. So it needs to build some rooms, needs to build furniture, it needs to go out to collect money. And uh, manage a whole lot of resources. So I need to make sure we've got enough uh, power, enough money, enough influence, enough etc. Um, to keep all the minions happy and keep the base uh, operating a, um, in a good state. And create defenses to repel any force of justice trying to go in. And eventually you build your doomsday device and win the game by taking over the world. So the system we build here can play the entire campaign for all the uh, evil geniuses from beginning to end. And it takes about 70 hours on average to get through the entire campaign. So normally we run these things over the weekend, and when we come back we see that the world has been dominated. So these are examples that uh, I've looked at. Let's see, present from current... Here we go. So another thing you can look at is uh, so-called goal recognition. So now we got a planning, um, a planning domain, and we can then know what actions uh, players entities can take. You can look up well. If you observe an AI entity or a player, can we figure out what it tries to do? So the idea here is they can use like goal recognition to. Uh, oh, Mrs. Lido, yes. Um, so the idea here is you could, you could try to figure out what is a play trying to achieve and what's the most likable plan it tries to go for. You can use this to make the game harder, so support enemies where the player is going to be, so your uh, AI direct, uh, director style in um, Left 4 Dead. Or you can use existing AI to try to intercept the player, try to uh, prevent from achieving its goals. Or if you've got some body AI, you can think, well, if I know roughly what the player is trying to do, I can take create a plan uh, to make it easier for the player to do so. Or I can, you know, help use like in your tutorial system where you can figure out what the player is trying to do and then give additional uh, hints and tips that are relevant to what the player is trying to achieve. So what you, so here we assume that the player is rational, tries to optimize. The plan the action takes to achieve the goal, so it doesn't uh, you know do unnecessary uh, actions uh, to get to the goal state. So what you do is you just look, observe the, the the player doing things and figure out well what what's the player going to do. So in this case, so it's player trying to get to the exit, or it's trying to steal secret documents. So if you see the player kill the zombie, then you can say okay, it's probably not trying to get to the exit anymore because it's not necessary to kill the zombie to do to go there. But after the player moves to the to the zombie, you can say okay, now it definitely uh, is most likely trying to get to the secret documents. And you can use information then to you know give context uh, tutorials or to have the other enemies in the game react properly. We're trying to uh, prevent the player from doing so. Or we've got a body AI will basically then go to the door and try to cover it from the enemies to allow the player to get there safely. Uh, so last thing I'll touch upon is a uh, basically a nice bit of uh, research currently going on in academia uh, called narrative planning, where you try to create uh, narrative of stories using an AI playing system. So earlier work looked at creating story arcs with different tensions. So it tries to Go by your act one, two, and three of your traditional uh, story arc, and ask the planner to follow like a certain curve of tension throughout the story, 
using, um, in case of Julia Porter's work, the Merchant of Venice, uh, and use snippets of those and put them in the right context to create a story that has like the nice, uh, the required self tension throughout the uh, as the story unfolds. Um, or recently, people thinking into uh, using a fear of mind model, where you try to reason about, um, I want to get stuff done, but I'm only allowed to take actions that make uh, sense if it furthers my goal in the story. So say I am Romeo, I'm basically for love with Juliet, so I need to take actions that will get me further towards uh, Juliet falling in love with me. Uh, so a vendor might try to sell stuff and it tries to maximize profits. So I can think of playing system that goes, okay, I need to go to this vendor, buy a flower, and I know that the vendor will accept me buying the flower because the vendor tries to maximize how much money I have and I'll, I'll pay money to get the vendor to sell me flowers. And there's very interesting work into this bit to use planning to create believable stories where all actors uh, behave freshly in accordance with trying to maximize their utility uh, set by the, uh, by the actors. And there's like lots of work by uh, Stephen Wire and uh, Corey Silf, which I uh, definitely uh, encourage you to, to explore. Uh, so that's all I've got. Um, so I might be a QA, and a I might not be. Uh, but thank you for listening. And if you want to reach out to me, uh, use my Twitter handle uh, to send me any messages. And I'll uh, give you my email address if uh, required to have a chat about any questions or suggestions you might have. So thank you and see you around.